As Aethys's voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain, but already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mortar and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aethys. As the light of thousands of souls leaves Mara Snua's body, dead fire quakes, the sea churns. All around the archipelago, long-forgotten Anguithan ruins rise from the rubble and the waves, a lost bounty of ancient knowledge now laid bare for Kith. The Huana lay claim to Deadfire's ruins and lead efforts to explore them. They prove especially adept at deciphering the secrets of Ukaizo, emboldening efforts to recreate the work of the Anguithans. Priests, mystics, and visionaries around the world dream of ancient pasts. Scholars delve into the annals of history. All of Aeora gazes backward to find its way forward. What remains to be seen is whether Kith will find the same answers the Anguithans did, and whether they will apply them to the same effect. Reclaiming Ukaizo is both a symbolic and a practical victory for the Hawana. The ancient city is a potent reminder of their people's ancient glory, and it promises to be a much more easily defensible capital, especially with the storm controls of Andra's spire close at hand. The other tribes unite under the Kahanga and dedicate themselves to rebuilding Ukaizo and relearning its secrets. The Valian Trading Company continues its operations in Deadfire, though it is forced to renegotiate many of its contracts with the newly empowered Juana Crown. Company leadership finds that the new terms are much more favorable to the tribes than to their own interests in the region. Due to these changes, the Valian Trading Company eventually withdraws most of its people from Deadfire. Though Castal convinces the Sangreta Mea Compressa to maintain nominal animancy operations in the region, they agree and put him in charge of them. Most of the Republics consider this an embarrassing demotion though Castal himself relishes his smaller, quieter role. The Royal Deadfire Company is expelled from the archipelago as punishment for their attack at Andra's Mortar. The storms across the Rawatayan mainland subside along with those of Andra's Mortar. However, Rawatai regards this respite with a wary eye, ever mindful that the machinery at Andra's Spire remains under their foe's control. The last thing Two-Eyed Pym wants is leadership over the divided Principi. But he finds himself thrust into the role nonetheless. To the surprise of all, he prospers. While he lacks Ferrante's charisma and Aldi's bravura, he proves to have a knack for delegation and an excellent head for business. And despite all the changes in Deadfire, the archipelago still hunger for trade. Under him, the Principi Sen Petrena evolve into a transit company, one of the largest and certainly the best armed in all of Aora. And as the only sizable outfit without a connection to any rival government, Pym finds himself in a rather profitable niche indeed. Despite other tensions across the archipelago, Port Mage remains a model of peaceful, productive cooperation between the Juana and the Valian Trading Company. Though they do not always agree, Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa work together for the mutual benefit of their people. As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. Though the Kahanga monarchy moves its new seat of government to Ukaizo, Nekataka continues to be a busy and important city. The Kahanga leadership takes responsibility for the welfare of the Raparu, and the gullet starts to improve. What was once a den of crime, poverty, and illness slowly becomes a quiet haven for the Raparu. Ukaizo reveals more about the ancient art of water shaping than the guild could have hoped to learn in another century of work. With this new knowledge, Water shapers across the archipelago wield the currents and bend the waves for the pleasure and benefit of the new Juana nation. Your brief encounter with Letharn 
proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawn Stars. He comes to recognize his nightmares and the scene at Hisongo as Aethys' final warning to his people. Unite in strength and faith, or perish forever. As word of Aethys' deeds at Ukaizo spreads, his fellow Dawn Stars take this message to heart. The faith of the children of the Dawn Stars brightens. Aethys returned to give the world the greatest gift of all, hope. In response, they continue feeding, healing, and helping the neediest in Deadfire, just as they have for decades. It remains their holy mission, and they will persevere in love and faith. The Adra at Pokokohara is restored, but the rumored Valian Trading Company post never comes to Tikawara. Torn between waiting and seeking better fortunes elsewhere, the tribe gradually scatters and fragments. Ships continue to disappear at the southeastern fringe of the archipelago, and stories circulate of a colony of vampires and gulls preying on their crews. The queen soon sends a contingent of her bravest warriors who end the horrors of Splintered Reef. Though your adventures alter the destiny of Aeora and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed in ways both big and small. Adair returns to Hisongo, where he reunites with Burn, the son of his former lover, Elava. The boy takes heart in Adair's account that Aethys and all the other gods were false, petty, and unworthy of the love of Kith. Realizing how close he came to dying for this cause, Burn finds renewed purpose in working alongside his uncle to repair the many scars left upon dead fire by the gods. Under Adair's guidance, Burn grows into the kind of irreverent, stubborn hothead that would have made his mother proud. And Adair visits her gravesite, often to tell her so. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind, and Shodi begins teasing the veteran fighter in a more companionable and less amorous manner. After saving each other's hides a couple times and sharing more than a few laughs, the two form an easy, and you suspect, lifelong friendship. Seemingly lit with an inner glow, Shodi takes to a new life of mission work with Gusto. She still is committed to shepherding souls for gone, but having realigned her goals with that of her fellow Dawn Stars, she now endeavors to help the living as much as the dead. As you travel the dead fire, you find her sleeping better and laughing more often. When the time comes for her to return to her temple in Nekataka, it's with a clear wistfulness and much lip biting on her part. She leaves you with her sickle and a hastily scrawled note. It reads, A keepsake from a path once walked. Remember me, Watcher, for I will forever dream of you. If Aloth has learned one thing from your adventures, it is that the forces shaping the world are vaster and more complex than he had ever imagined. And they are far beyond anyone's power to control. Thus, it is with great relief that he abandons his labors against the Leaden Key. Without Theus at the helm, it will crumble in its own time. The best he can do is stand back and allow it to happen. You let Romaro go, and the former pirate ostensibly set sail for the trade lanes of the Eastern Reach, the Edir Empire, Old Valia, and the Republics. For the remainder of your time together, Seraphin seems, if not exactly happy, at least contented with the outcome of your confrontation 
with his former mentor at Sayuka. And yet, when the two of you part, Seraphin seems emboldened, invigorated by a new sense of purpose. He buys you a drink, toasts to the dead fire, says, let's see if we can make something worth a shit out of what's left of these Principe swaps, and sets sail the next morning. In the years to follow, rumors occasionally reach you of the Blue Orland Pirate of the Dead Fire, a privateer captain as keen to free slaves or fight foreign influence as he is to plunder and pillage. For assisting the Watcher with the Juana conquest of Ukaizo, Pelagina is immediately dismissed from the Brotherhood, but the Duke stops short of banishing her from the Republics. Director Castal intercedes on her behalf, pleading with the Dukes for her assistance with his ongoing work in the Deadfire. Reluctantly, the Dukes readmit Pelagina to the Fremas Mes Conxualias. She remains Director Castal's only official support from the Dukes in the region. Pelagina renews her relationship with Jackalo, corresponding with him regularly, and even meeting with the old Animancer once or twice a year. Though she does not understand the intricate details of his research, she reads his letters and responds with great enthusiasm. Her brothers, and even the dukes themselves, note that Palagina's demeanor is always warmer on the days when she receives a letter. Rumors even spread that some of the brothers have seen her smile. Time away from the Navy gives Maya Rua some perspective on how Rawatai conducted the dead fire occupation. No sooner does she return to active duty than she voices her frustrations over some of the more underhanded tactics she witnessed and carried out in the name of the homeland. Her voice carries all the way to the Ranganui, who reminds his admirals that battles are won by superior tactics, but war is a battle of precedent and winning is not always a victory. The people listen. She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. The discovery of Ukaizo doesn't bring to Kehu the answers that he sought, but this proves only a minor setback. Merely knowing that Ngati's Chosen landed on the island ignites something in the Huana tribes a fervent desire to recover the past and let history illuminate the way forward. Takehu rides this momentum, leading by example and teaching his people to rely on each other instead of on omens. His message is an upheaval of norms, but it's as embraced and beloved as he is. As your paths diverge, Takehu leaves you with a protracted and energetic farewell. He has work to do in the dead fire, but his heart, and he insists the rest of him, is yours. You make promises to see each other again on different shores. Your pursuit of Aethys and your journey to Ukaizo signal the end of forces that have shaped the lives of Kith and the course of nations. The cycle of reincarnation has been broken. The storms of Andra's mortar have calmed. Yet each ending promises a new beginning. As the sun rises over Ukaizo, Kith turn their gaze eastward, wondering at what lies beyond, and at the world they will fashion for themselves. As the Watcher of Kadnua and the former Herald of Bereth, you return to your ship and begin the long journey home. You hope for calm weather. <laughs>